Well, welcome everyone. Father Joe, the chaplain here. This is Mr. Brennan. He's our campus minister. We work together on spiritual formation stuff. So we've got a little presentation prepared for you. Got some notes so we keep track of where we're at. We're going to kind of switch back and forth with who's talking, and hopefully it'll be helpful and good. <laughs> so first, uh, just to kind of give you a little bit of context for this presentation, this is part of a series of Partnering with Parents presentations which are designed to just help keep our parents informed about things going on here at school, how we're living out our mission. And so just to kind of refresh everyone's memory, this is our mission here at Lansing Catholic. Students spiritually, intellectually, and socially into faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. So that's our mission. And those three categories correspond to the three deans that we have. They're kind of like assistant principals, if you will. You probably know these guys, so yours truly, right there, the Joe. Uh, and then Chris Stolpa is our Dean of Intellectual Formation, and Chris Lee is the Dean of Social Formation. Stolpa gave the first one of these presentations, that was back in November, and then January, Mr. Louie gave a presentation on Social Formation, and then tonight, here we are. We're going to do a little presentation on Spiritual Formation. So first, just wanted to tell you a little bit about myself, because... Uh, I don't know, maybe you're interested, maybe not, but here we go. <laughs> I was born in 1991, so I'm 32 years old, turning 33 later this year, uh, from Ann Arbor, Michigan, so go blue. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know, sorry, but just it, it's, it's too hard not to say that when you live near East Lansing. <laughs> I was homeschooled pretty much my whole life, except for fourth grade, and I felt the call to the priesthood from a pretty young age. Uh, in high school, I sort of was going back and forth on it, but ultimately ended up going to seminary. That's another long story, so I won't get into all that. Uh, went to seminary, hoping I would just get kicked out or something, but clearly that didn't happen. And um, anyways, went to, went to high school and then a college seminary in Minnesota at St. John Vianney College Seminary, and I graduated from there in 2013. So I got a bachelor's degree in philosophy and also in Catholic studies. And then after that, I went to major seminary, which is kind of like graduate school. That was in Detroit here in Michigan, and I was there for four years as well. Graduated in 2017, and that's where I got my master's degree in theology. So my first parish assignment was in Brighton, Michigan, not too far from here, serving at St. Pat's Parish. I was the parochial vicar, and I was there for four years as well, 2017 until 2021. I was thinking the other day as I was driving, like my whole life has been split up into four-year segments for a while. Four years of high school, four years of college, four years of major seminary, four years at the parish. Next would be my fourth year here. So like, let's, let's see if I break that trend or stick with it. We'll, we'll have to wait and see. <laughs> and yeah, now I'm in my third year here at Lansing Catholic, and I am loving it. So that's a little bit about me. Let's hear about Mr. Brennan. Yeah, so... Um I grew up in East Lansing, so go green. Yeah, I mean, I was a crazy MSU fan for, um, and still am, and went to college there and went to high school here, so graduated 2003 from Lansing Catholic, graduated 2007 from MSU. My brilliant plan growing up was that I was going to do what my dad did. My dad was a lawyer and a judge, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll be a lawyer and a judge just like my dad. And so I went to law school right after college. And uh, in law school, I realized like, oh man, I really do not like this. Like, this is not what I think I'm called to do. And so then it kind of led to this crisis of, well, what is, what did God make me to do? And, and, uh, and eventually I had a really powerful encounter with the Lord, powerful encounter with the Holy Spirit in 2012. Uh, that kind of shifted the direction of my whole life. And so for about the last 11 years, I've been in different ministry roles. I was in seminary for three years. Um, I've taught high school. I've taught middle school. Uh, I was at Powers Catholic in Flint for the past two years before coming to Lansing Catholic this year. So as you guys know, anytime you give your life to the Lord, it's like, the, the 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 adventure of discipleship and it has been an amazing adventure and never in my wildest dreams did I think I'd ever come back to the high school I graduated at but that's you know God tends to surprise us um, and uh, he certainly surprised me in some amazing ways and so my wife also works here part-time um, Lynn Brennan is the social worker here and um, we just had our first child in December so it's a it's a very grace-filled year so how would you rate the quality of your sleep right now, now that you have a little one back home? A scale from 1 to 10. 
I, one of my buddies from college is married. He's got, I think, four kids, maybe five. And uh, he came to my ordination reception with his wife and his newborn. And in addition to being sleep deprived because of the jet lag from coming from California, they also were sleep deprived from the little one. <laughs> and they said they got halfway to the ordination party and were just getting tired. And so they pulled over and slept for like an hour <laughs> before getting there because they were just so tired. So he's like, I've never in my life have I been this tired <laughs> after having a kid. Next, I want to talk a little bit about my role as the chaplain because sometimes people wonder, Exactly, does a chaplain do? What is his job at the high school? And I was asking those same questions when I came here to the high school because this is definitely very different than being at the parish, which I uh, had sort of got the hang of. And so let's just talk a little bit about that. So first of all, as a chaplain, I'm not in charge of the school. <laughs> That's Dominic's job. He's the president. I'm also not just another employee or I'm not a teacher. The bishop actually doesn't want us teaching full time because that just sort of eats up all your time and your resources. So what exactly am I here to do? Well, the, the bishop has appointed me to be here to serve as the spiritual and, and sacramental provider for the school. So my first job, first and foremost, is to provide the sacraments here and to be available to the students and the staff for spiritual direction and, you know, all the things you might want out of a priest at your parish. So I say Mass every day here in the chapel, and it's uh, open to all of our students. It's kind of early in the day most days, so... Attendance can be kind of light because of that. Uh, but then also once a week, there's the required Mass, which is during the school day. So Tuesdays, we have half the school there. Wednesdays, we have the other half. It's during their Rajinka time. And then also every Friday, we have adoration throughout the day, and all the students will come down at certain points uh, during their theology classes, and they'll have some time in adoration. And starting last year, just sort of on a whim, I started offering confessions during adoration, and... Um, Normally, I would just do confessions during lunch period on Mondays and Wednesdays, and in a, an entire week with those different lunch periods combined, I'd probably get like maybe 10 or 15 kids in confession. And then that time I offered on Friday, I got like 72 in one day. So I was like, well, clearly this is the better time because they're already sitting there anyways, and if I just say, hey, do you want to go to confession, they'll start coming. So that's been a little change this year. I hear confessions pretty much all day on Fridays which is like time consuming, but it's great because they actually will come and uh, lots of kids are getting to confession that way. So that's probably the, the most important part of my job is doing all that and then also providing spiritual direction. Students don't necessarily like ask for that or they certainly won't use those words maybe, uh, but they'll pop in and talk about something or, or sometimes it'll happen in confession as well they, or they just want some guidance on things. Where I do more like formal spiritual direction is probably with the staff because, you know, we're adults. We're at a little bit of a different level with all that stuff and able to have prolonged conversations and whatnot. So uh, that's uh, part, of, part of my job here as, as the chaplain. But beyond all that, how else does a chaplain decide how to, to use his time? Well, it kind of depends on, you know, my own interests and what the needs of the school are. Every high school is sort of in a different place and has different needs. So every chaplain sort of does things kind of differently. But here at Lansing Catholic, what I've ended up doing is taking on the role of the Dean of Spiritual Formation, which is certainly part of the admin team here at the school. So that means there's kind of like the teacher, half of the whole staff there in the classroom every day. They're with the students face-to-face -face all that time. And then there's the administrative team, which is more behind the scenes, keeping the school running. And so I'm very much in that realm. So I go to the leadership team meetings where we discuss all kinds of things and make decisions about things going on here at school. And then I also lead the spiritual formation team. We have a meeting once a week. Speaking of which, let's show you who's on the spiritual formation team. So there you have it, me, Mr. Brennan, and then Ms. DeVries does, she wears a lot of hats here at school. Uh, this is one of them. She is the coordinator for all of our service events. We'll talk a little bit more about those later. And then also Miss Webster is our librarian. That's her primary role, uh, but she also keeps track of all these service hours for all the students in the building, which again, we'll talk about that at the end. But this is basically the spiritual formation team right there. So what do we all do as a team? Well, we handle all the liturgical events here at school. So Guardians of the Altar, which is our student club to serve or be sacristans or help at mass. Uh, the music ministry, we also have a discipleship group that meets on Thursday mornings. We handle things like the prayers that we say at the beginning uh, of each day. Well, that one's the same for the whole year, but the end of day changes for each month of the year. 
We also organize and orchestrate all the retreats for this trip, service hours, all that stuff is, uh, is what we do at the spiritual formation team. I keep, I keep looking at this picture of me because I'm like, man, I look so rested <laughs> back in September. It's like, yeah, man. Wow. <laughs> okay. So um, the thing I want to talk about is Father Joe's describing, you know, kind of how we're set up as a campus ministry team and what our overall responsibilities are. But, um, but I want to describe like our strategy and what is our what is our mission in terms of spiritual formation so you can go ahead and put that up there so the mission of spiritual formation is to bring our staff and students into ongoing encounters with the person of Jesus Christ and his church and to empower them to live the faith in a community of his disciples so um, if you were to boil it down to two words, basically encounter and empower. Um, and how do we do this? So the, um, the annual way or the, the um, I would say like um, sort of the, the big event way that we do that encounter is um, through our Damascus retreats that Father Joe's going to talk about here in a minute. And then uh, as far as empower, we want to offer ongoing discipleship through um, monthly adoration nights and then ongoing small groups and ongoing discipleship groups. So um, the idea is like that your encounter with Jesus leads to a, a life lived for him in the context of community and um, with other brothers and sisters. And so that could be both staff and students we're talking about here, not just the student experience, but also the staff experience being one of encounter and empower. Um, and one other, one other image that kind of comes to mind when I think of this is if you were to have like, um, kind of like three, three concentric circles, right? And the, the large circle being like the encounter event, and then the middle circle being like, the, the monthly or the, uh, the small group formation. And then finally that inner circle being like your personal prayer life with God and your day-to-day -day life with him. So um, we really want to cover like all of those levels, the annual, the monthly, the weekly, and the daily. So Father Joe's going to talk a little bit about um, more what that looks like. Part of the formation here is not only for our students, but for our staff, right? Because if we're going to be serious about bringing our students into a deeper relationship with Jesus, we've got to be living that ourselves, right? You get that as parents. If you want your kids to do something, it's much more effective if you actually model that for them rather than just telling them about it. So that's certainly a big part of what we take into account when we're making new hires, when we're trying to fill positions here. But also uh, we do provide retreat formation for our staff. Uh, something that's a little bit new since I've been here is we also offer a personal retreat day for each person on staff so they can sign up for that and they get to come to school on a normal day but instead of doing whatever they normally do we get a sub for them if needed and they get to spend the day uh, in prayer and then in spiritual direction and we give them lunch and then they get a little bit of downtime so we're trying to care for our staff as well. As Mr. Brennan mentioned, we sort of have a couple of main prongs of uh, approach here. First of all, encounter. We want our students to truly encounter Jesus here at school. And the primary vehicle for that is our annual retreat. So that is one of the requirements here for all of our students, that they go on a retreat every year. And this whole understanding of an annual retreat is something that goes pretty deep in the mind of the church. It's something that's actually in canon law for priests that we have to go on retreat every year. And there's just something about that, taking that time once a year to get away from all the busyness of our lives and all the things that we do to make time for Jesus to really work on our hearts, to speak to us. And so we, we have that uh, built into our whole program here at school so the students go on retreat. And there's been a lot of development and change over how the retreats go exactly over the last 10 years. There's been a lot of growth in that. And what we're moving in the direction more recently of doing is bringing our students to uh, a place in Ohio called Damascus, which is a Catholic mission hub. Some of you might be familiar with it. Their, their main thing they do is Catholic youth summer camp. 
and that's throughout the summer, obviously. <laughs> but during the school year, they uh, do high school retreats. And I've been on lots of different retreats, not only when I was in school, but since then as a priest. And I can say, like, of all the things I've been on, these are some of the best retreats for high schoolers. They just do a really good job of speaking to them at their level and providing an environment that's fun, but also very in the faith encounter Jesus as not just a distant spiritual figure, but someone who's real for them, who wants to have an effect in their life. So we brought all of our freshmen there last year on their retreat, and then we brought our freshmen this year. So now half of the student body has been to this retreat. And the plan next year is to just bring the entire school. (laughs) So that's going to be our encounter experience for the year for all of our students. And then the next key component is discipleship. One of the things that I've noticed just in my couple of years here is we do the retreats pretty well, but then the part that's often missing is the follow-up, right? You could have a great retreat experience, and no matter how good it is, it can fade away if it's not kind of nurtured and cultivated, those graces received. We actually just heard a testimony from one of our students who said exactly that. He went to Damascus last year, changed his life, it was great, and then it all kind of just faded away. And now he just went on another retreat and is wanting to, like, keep this alive. And he's, you know, wondering, how do I do that? Well, this is one of the the solutions to that. This is one of our strategies for how do we really walk with these students. And so we're really going to focus more on this in the coming years, building up these small groups for our students, which isn't like some magic pill that's going to fix all this. But there's a lot of evidence, and just from talking to different priests who have been involved in these circles, that small group is probably the most effective vehicle for really walking with students and helping them see how their faith can become real in their everyday life. All right, so kind of the the final part that we want to describe here is our service hours and mission trips. And when we talk about encounter, discipleship, and power, um, supernaturally that should lead to a life of like, I want to give to others. And obviously, I remember when I was a uh, student here, I didn't necessarily understand why we did service hours or why we offered mission trips. It was like, why do we do that? Like, wouldn't it just be easier? If we didn't have to. And But, uh, you know, now that I'm in the, this position, it's like, oh, that makes sense, right? That that makes sense that we would make that part of the, of the school experience because we want our students to go beyond these walls to touch other lives. The, the service hour requirement is um, if, if you're an incoming freshman or if you're, if, you, if you're a freshman this year, you'll complete 100 hours by the time you graduate. And that was ramped up a little bit as of this year. It's like five less hours. So if you're, if you're a sophomore, it's 95. If you're a junior, it's 90. If you're a senior, it's 85. But going forward, anybody that comes here as a student would do 100 hours, which seems like, wow, you know, how do I complete that? But we, we actually do a lot at the school to kind of build in a few service experiences. So you already have a bunch of service hours completed through things like Cougar Commotion, which is a fall event where we bring in a bunch of partner schools, grade school kids, and the students serve for the day. And then the spring workathon, um, and then the mission trips that we have are also a huge opportunity for service. So like if a student does all three of these, they're gonna have, I'm not sure exactly how many that adds up to, but adds up to a bunch of hours just by these events alone. So there's actually not that many left for a a student to complete on their own. But one thing to, to keep in terms of service hours is sometimes I know students might think like, oh man, I'm just checking a box. But really what I try to encourage students to think about is how is God calling you to serve? It can actually, you know, if if somebody, let's say, wants to do some sort of elder care or working with children or um, could be some sort of hospital ministry or, you know, whatever it might be. But it's like, think about what would what would light your heart up, right? What would make it so that you look forward to this and maybe ultimately it would lead to like a life of service in this area or even potentially a career. So this is more, way more than just checking a box. It it can actually lead to like somebody realizing, oh my gosh, I was actually born to serve in this way. I help with the Alabama mission trip every spring break. So that's coming up here 
And that's probably our biggest one. We usually have like 40 to 50 students that participate. The other ones are a little bit smaller. I also lead the Upper Peninsula trip. That one is in June. And <laughs> I don't know if I should tell people this or not because it might make them not want to come. But it's a little rustic. We go to this retreat center in Paradise, Michigan that is off the grid. So there is like electricity, but it's all with solar panels and batteries and that sort of thing. And uh, there's a full kitchen. The food was actually really good. But you had to wear mosquito nets over your head the entire time because the bugs were that bad. But it was fun. Like we split a bunch of wood. We cleared a bunch of trails. So if you've got any boys or girls back home that like the outdoors and need to blow off some steam at the beginning of the summer, just send them to the UP mission trip because we certainly get lots of good work <laughs> done there. <laughs> well, I guess the last thing I wanted to talk about was when it comes to the liturgy, because sometimes I get questions like, what's with all the incense? Why do you have all these candles and bells? And just wanted to explain why, why we do all that, because it's actually pretty intentional uh, that we do those things. So part of the reason why our liturgies, especially like in the gym when we have an all-school mass, we try to really pull out all the stops to make it seem as churchy as possible because, right, we're in a gym. <laughs> what do you do in a gym? Well, you watch basketball, you play games, and it can sort of set the mood for the students just by the fact that we're in a gymnasium. And so to counteract that, we really try to make it seem different. So we bring out that black carpeting, we put up banners of Joseph and Mary, we put up the curtain backdrop and spotlights, and we have candlesticks and incense and all of that is meant to emphasize that this is something different. We're not just here for another sporting event. We're not just here for another academic thing. We're here to encounter God. And that in the liturgy, we offer the, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. This is a very important thing. It's a very uh, a special thing. And secondly, every age in the life of the church has its own challenges, its own unique factors involved. And it seems that nowadays, one of the factors that's becoming very influential, especially in young people's lives, is the fact that we live in a world that is so godless, right? It used to be that even casual culture sort of acknowledged God and had some sense of Christian values, even if it wasn't like forced on people necessarily, but those days are long gone. <laughs> Christianity has been pushed so far outside of the mainstream that Many people don't really have encounters with God in their everyday life if they're not going to church or something like that. And so what we're seeing more and more in ministry today is that this transcendence in the liturgy is really what's speaking to young people's hearts and what's drawing them to come back to church, that they want to come to a place where they know they're going to encounter God. <laughs> They're not just interested in more casual social gatherings. They've got plenty of those, and most of them are better than the ones that we provide in churches. <laughs> They're not just here to be entertained because they've got plenty of entertainment. Other places, again, that's much better than what we can provide at church. They are coming, if they're coming, <laughs> because they want to encounter God and they want to offer him worship. And so with all the liturgies that we do here at school, we're definitely emphasizing that aspect, that this is a supernatural event, that God is present, and so... We pull out all the stops. We have all these servers. We have incense. We have bells. We have nice vestments. It's all meant to really speak to that place in the hearts of young people and draw them into that encounter with God who comes to us through the sacraments. I think that's pretty much it. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. I do need to make a little plug for our podcast. If you haven't heard about this, we do have a podcast. And if you want to just like keep in touch with things going on here at school, this can be an easy, convenient way to do so. It's really designed for you, the parents. Feel free to find us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and wherever you listen to your favorite shows to get all the latest at Lansing Catholic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So any, any questions or comments about anything we've said or anything we didn't say that you want to talk about? Yes. Yes. So uh, we've got somebody asking about RCIA here at school. So yes, we do offer formation here at school for students or staff who want to become Catholic. Typically that's done at the parish, but part of the convenience of being here at school with the students every day is it's very easy to make that happen here. And so at the start of the school year, I knew there were a lot of students that were interested. So I reached out to their respective pastors and said, hey, you've got this kid here who wants to become Catholic, is it okay with you if I do the formation here at school 
And then once they're finished with the formation and we get to Easter, they'll go to your parish and receive the sacraments there. So that's what we did. So we have six students that are all being brought into the church uh, in a couple of days at the Easter vigil. And then we also have two staff members. And Kenny's situation is kind of neat because it's his whole family. So he was baptized as a kid, but his wife and three kids are not baptized. And so at the Easter vigil, he's going to be brought into the church by receiving confirmation, first communion, and then his wife and kids are going to get all three, baptism, confirmation, first communion, so all going to be brought into the church. So there should be a pretty good showing at that Mass. It'll be at St. Martha's in Okemos. There's going to be a lot of Lansing Catholic people going, I think, because we've got not only our two uh, staff members, but two of our students will also be coming in there. This is the most we've had, in a, as far as we know, like in a, in a long time, coming into the church uh, from the school here to have six students and two staff. It's it's pretty cool. So we hope that that trend continues. I do know of at least one student who was just on retreat who mentioned that they might be interested in becoming Catholic. So that's a good sign to say the least. I was just thinking, I just want to pray for you guys because I feel like part of the Christian life is um, like seeking the Lord. And I just feel like you guys being here, it's like you're seeking him and you're, and you're seeking him on behalf of your kids. So I just want to bless you guys for doing that. So could we just pray for you for a minute? That'd be great. All right, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So God, I just thank you for these amazing parents. I just thank you for their kids and uh, all of our families, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. I just pray your anointing upon their Easter celebrations and um, their celebration of the Triduum. Come, Holy Spirit, and light their hearts on fire and... Um, Father, we just thank you for providing for all their needs and uh, giving them all through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thank